All right, welcome in everyone. It's my pleasure right now to be joined with a guy who certainly has earned a name for himself in the Baton Rouge market, the Louisiana market, and beyond. Jordy Collada. Jordy, thanks for being here, man. JD, thanks for having me, man. Good to see you. Absolutely. And uh, we have so much that uh, I wanted to uh, talk to you about. Uh, first off, as somebody joked with me so much for the dog days of summer. <laughs> There's been so much news and huge news that has happened over the summertime when we're typically, you know, doing lists of our favorite games or favorite LSU Tigers. Mount Rushmore. Or Mount Rushmore. <laughs> yeah. Those kind of things that gobble up time. But uh, the latest news that Oklahoma and Texas are going to leave the Big 12 and come to the SEC is uh, what's shaking right now. You and I were both at SEC Media Days last week when the news started to leak, and this thing is charging uh, full steam ahead. It is rolling downhill now, and it seems like, obviously, with the news over the last 24 hours with Texas and Oklahoma not renewing their media rights in the Big 12 and then formally asking for an invitation into the SEC here uh, early on this Tuesday, uh, that it seems like it's imminent. It, it's going to happen. And um, you're right. I mean, you know, last week, the beginning of SEC Media Days, we were talking about the transfer portal. We were talking about name, image, and likeness. We were talking even about uh, Ross Dellinger, our friend's piece over at Sports Illustrated, where he had a very in depth sit down with Greg Sankey, in which Sankey was uh, very critical of, of the NCAA and Mark Emmert and just what the future could hold with that organization. And then, you know, come uh, a week ago, uh, yeah. Tomorrow, a week ago on Wednesday, about 2 o'clock, as Jimbo Fisher and Texas A&M are, are making their way through the SEC Media Day uh, kind of car wash. I mean, just this bombshell drops from the Houston Chronicle. Uh, and here we are uh, early this week talking about it happening. I mean, there will be a 16-team SEC that features Texas and Oklahoma. And I, I, I envision that probably happening sooner, sooner uh, than 2025. I think you just recently interviewed uh, Billy Lucci, yeah. who owns TexasAgs.com, which is a very powerful website that covers Texas A&M athletics. Uh, a footnote on that, uh, they pay two Texas A&M student athletes $10,000 a piece yeah. to give an interview before SEC Media Days, which somebody in the media says, uh-oh, right. <laughs> when's the first person in Baton Rouge going to do something like that? And yeah. it's like, yeah, you can't talk to Miles Brennan or you can't talk to Max Johnson because yeah such and such is paying but uh but anyway uh, he interviewed with you and certainly the one team that's not going to vote for uh texas and oklahoma to join is texas a&m yeah they they i mean i've heard over the years like when the texas bowl tried to pair up texas and texas a&m oh bad idea i mean <laughs> it just goes beyond just a rivalry oh we can't stand you guys it is a deep hatred it is a resentment it is a can't be in the same room well lucci in his first 10 minutes of the interview i mean you can hear it through his voice. I mean, without him really saying, I hate, we hate Texas, I mean, he's, he's oozing it out of his, just everything that he's talking. I mean, um, the, the, I don't think we, we understand the hatred for those two schools or for what Texas A&M has for Texas. You could see Ross Bjork was obviously rattled last week at SEC Media Day, Jimbo Fisher was obviously stunned. Unusual for an athletic director to show up at SEC Media Days. It, it was, it was. But in doing a little bit of background, B Bjork had been there a couple of times as Ole Miss's AD. It wasn't as if yeah. it wasn't too outside of the box for him to be there. So, because okay. I, I, I was I was very speculative on, wait, hold up. Well, did you not know? <laughs> Why were you there? I mean, but yeah. uh, it, it was a trip that he said that, that he's made in the past. And uh, he obviously did not know that that story was going to break them because you could see that he was very ill prepared on the spot in the moment to very you know to answer the question and, and Lucci came back and, and said on the latest from Texas A&M that they have met board of directors all of the the athletic committee and he anticipates that they will vote yay for for Texas and oh Oklahoma they will vote them in to to uh, come into the conference because I think they saw how bad of a look it was for them to kind of be out in the public and 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 griping and complaining about it and mm -hmm. you know I, I think that um, all the athletic directors the, pre the 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 presidents the chancellors um, this is a financial decision job you know I mean when it comes down to the money and for Texas to leave their network behind their own television station that is dedicated to their university and athletic department and solely their their football program for them to say you know what we'll keep the six hundred million dollars we'll walk away from it and sacrifice it they must see a just huge payday over the hill in the Southeastern Conference. Yeah, not to mention, Jordy, yeah, we'll pay $70 million to leave the uh, conference sure. early, right? Right. You yeah. know, 
I'm just finished with Red Rock and Blue. We're 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 just trying to scrap by and get fifty thousand. You know, yeah, right. these guys are just blowing Here's million. eighty million for you not to have me. <laughs> right, right. You know, just to pay coaches millions just to go away. You right. know. Um, it, it does get a little nauseating sometimes, but that, that we're, we're in big time college athletics here. And I don't see there's any way, right, that Texas and Oklahoma make it to the finish line of 2025. I, I don't. I, there's no way. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, do you break up with your girlfriend that you live with and stay with her for two years in the house? I mean, that was going to call for very awkward times, man. I mean, it's going to be very, very weird. Um, and and uh, I anticipate with the amount of money that both those schools have. You know, I don't think anybody can rival Texas in the in, in the bank account department, but Oklahoma's got a nice, you know, slush fund to play with with the amount of success that they've had in sports and in football. Um, that one year in the Big 12, and then this this number goes down to somewhere around 40 million. I think that those two schools will probably cut the check, and we could be looking at Texas and Oklahoma in the S in the SEC as, as as early as next season. What I was envisioning too was just imagine if Oklahoma or Texas they, they win the Big 12 this year and the host are hoisting up that trophy. <laughs> We're so proud to be part of this <laughs> conference, right. you know. This is we a big accomplishment. We being here. <laughs> <laughs> this is a big accomplishment. Right. We're leaving. <laughs> uh, we're on our way out, yeah. but uh, so yeah, that, those awkward things as well. Uh, there's so many layers to this w that we could discuss. So 11 out of the 14 SEC teams have to vote this to to make it a reality. Uh, Charles Hanegriff, our friend, I, I thought he put it well on the radio. He said Greg Sankey's basically become the czar of college mm -hmm. football at I this agree. point. College sports. I mean, can, yeah. can you argue that he's the most powerful figure in college sports right now? I mean, he's he, he's he's done all but ignore Mark Emmert in the NCAA. I mean, it's almost as if he's not even recognized who they are and what they even do at this point. I mean, if you add Texas and Oklahoma, when you add Texas and Oklahoma to the Southeastern Conference, um, I, I believe that that is almost just the tip of the, the, the tipping point, that, that you will see more teams, more power, more brand come to the Southeastern Conference where, it, Jacques, it, it could be a standalone. It, you know, I mean, it could be a standalone where it's not even named the SEC, where it's just almost like the NFL. Mm -hmm. and, and you've got two divisions that play one another and play in a playoff structure that, that crowns a champion. You've got the biggest television contract. You've got all the teams that create the most buzz and interest within the sport. And you're selling advertising around all of that, which the money is going into your, your back pocket. What, what, what do you need another governing body for? I mean, I, I think that really this is, where, this is where we're headed and we're flying to the finish. We're flying there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it used to be, it took so much work and time to get anything done in college football. Look how long it took us just to determine to get two teams into the BCS. Sure. And then it took forever to get four, a 14 playoff. And it's, me and some of the people have kind of talked about it. LSU winning the national championship in 2019, it, it, it felt like the end of something. Mm -hmm. like, like that was going to be the last team like that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so much has changed since that what was it January 13, 2020, with the the opting out, uh, things that have nothing to do with football as well, uh, you know, racial issues, the COVID, uh, that have everything to do with football at the same time, and then this name, image, and likeness, and there's just been just an enormous amount of change in a 15 month window. It is it is a totally different program than the day that they pulled out of New Orleans crown the national champion. I mean, it is a, it's got a totally different feel. Think about just the feeling around the head coach. Yeah. I mean, if you just solely isolate the feeling around Ed Ogeron during that time period to where it is now, to even being debating on, on whether or not how hot or warm his seat is going into this season, seems wild, but it, it feels very real when you look at the stuff that has happened since then to where LSU is going into the season and, and really, um, it, it feels like again going into this year that it's another crossroads for, for the program where it, it's either going to solidify Ogeron into kind of the next four to five year future of LSU football or there's going to be some big, big question marks to just how stable he is and the program is under his direction. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's just so unfortunate. Now look, I'm sure there's, there's some things that he'd probably go back and I need to do that differently. Sure. Bo Pelini and you know, Scott Linehan, that was a bust, and uh, some of the other things. But um, 
you know, certainly, what what was going to be a worst case scenario? Like, yeah, they'll go nine and three, and <laughs> right. uh, yeah. you know, they'll they'll lose a tight one to Alabama at home, yeah. and they might slip up a ten and two or something like that. Uh, we we, did, we certainly didn't think that you know Jamar Chase wasn't even going to make it to the field. Tyler Shelvin. Kerry Vincent, uh, on down the line, they weren't even going to play. Uh, Terrence Marshall played for a while, then he said, uh, yeah. I've had enough. Yeah, <laughs> just, so, and Miles Brennan was supposed to be your quarterback. He had played two true freshmen, so just everything just went sideways. And so, I've asked, I've talked to a few people about this. You think if Ogeron, would you define 10 and 2 as a bounce back season if they do that in the regular season? Coming up this year? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think that he would be very stable in what his job performance calls for and the production that you get back if he was to win 10 games on the schedule that he has. To me, the thing that is hovering over him more than anything, because I believe LSU is going to be good. I, I really, I think they're built to be good. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at their roster, they are, they're, they're built to be a very competitive team here in, in 2021. I think that the stuff surrounding yes. the, 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 the football program, if anything pops or flares up, then he's in trouble almost no matter the success that he has on the field. Now, if you combine that with sketchy play and, and question marks around this, what is deemed or at least thought to be solid team, I, I think he is, he's in trouble. But if you go 10 and two and the things stay pretty quiet off the field and, yeah. and, and that's, that's resolved, I, I, I think he's safe. Um, I, I think when you, you get into the eight and four, the, the type of nine and three that he would have to get there, um, then you're talking about what the future looks like at the head coaching spot at LSU. Um, ten games to me with, with, without anything hopping or popping off the field, I think he's safe. Yeah, because I think, you know, last year was a joyless season. Yeah. Just the fans were basically told, don't come to the stadium, uh, don't come tailgate. Um, the stadiums were empty. I, I made all the road trips where I go to Texas A&M or Missouri or Arkansas. Those people were like, man, we got LSU in town. This should be exciting. And the, the town's dead. We can't have the restaurants are dying. You know, we can't, same stuff. Can't tailgate, no crowd, all that stuff. So I'm just curious if they do bounce back, like you said, will people say, look, that was that COVID season. That wasn't really football. Throw that out. Um, asterisk. I think you could definitely get a pass for that season, depending on what happens around yep. the program. I, I definitely think that he has shown that he is committed to making and bringing LSU back to a highly competitive state within college football, to be one of the true players in the sport that can win a championship year in, year out. I think he got very comfortable last year. I, I think there were some things that were happening around the program that that he made some decisions that he would probably want back, some personnel choices that he made on the staff, mm -hmm. and, and then some public relations stuff that he did from, from his own individual personal self. Um, and, and I think that that still haunts him. And not to pile on, but I'm there at Christmas time, like shopping, and I'm seeing that book that he wrote, you know, and I'm just like, man, I yeah, mean, even it if was he, the worst case scenario uh, for that, you know, flip the script, you know, and then the flip the script got flipped again before right. the book even, came, you know, kind of came out on him there. So it, it truly, it's been an amazing career for him, hasn't it? Sure. I mean, the Ole Miss thing where he was mocked and ridiculed and then, you know, he wins everybody over at USC and they don't give him the job. And then he kind of became, uh, you know, uh, he, he was, I described it, Jordy, as being kind of like fix a flat, you know, and you, you, your tire goes flat, you know, Ed Orgeron's the guy to step in and keep mm -hmm. you going for a while, but is he a guy to be a head coach? Right. And certainly he stepped in and, and was doing a, uh, you know, certainly after he's the coach of the year in, in 2019, I mean, everything you could have ever dreamed of happening happens in one year. And so certainly I thought he had some hay in the barn and some equity, but um, they kind of burned up quick. Yeah, he burned it up quick. And I, I think that he lost the trust or lost some trust with the, the, the fan base because 2019 is exactly what he told you he was going to do when mm -hmm. he was introduced as the permanent head coach after the interim run. Yeah. He he's told not you, stubborn. He's he gonna, told you yeah. he was going to bring in guys around him that were smarter than him. He told you he was going to bring in guys around him that were forward thinking and allow them to do their job and just get out of the way. Last season it looked like he had seen the success of 19 and saw Joe Brady and Joe Burrow and Dave Aranda and a lot of people getting a lot of credit for that. And he was kind of looking around saying, where, 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 where's everybody talking about me at? I, I'm, I'm the kind of the, the guy that's running this ship and I'm the one that's making seven million a year. 
from the success of it, I'm going to do it my way. And then he comes out and admits that he didn't interview Bo Pelini, he didn't interview Scott Linehan, and, you know, all that stuff kind of blows up in his face. And then, you know, again, from the, the public relations standpoint, he did a lot of stuff to turn people off you know, last season with the, his, his personal decisions. And that's, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent, or whether it's unfair or fair, we can debate, but in that position, it's very public. It's public 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you're going to be criticized when you're living your life in the public. And that's what was happening. And one thing too, Jordy, and I know when we even venture to even mention politics, I'm kind of dancing around landmines uh, sure, here. Yeah. But he, Coach O does not strike me as a political person, okay? He brought in John Bell Edwards, a Democrat, to throw the football with the team. He's our governor, blah, blah, blah. And then they went to the White House after they won the national championship. And from what I understood from Michael Bonnet and everybody that went up there, they just treated them so well mm -hmm. at when they had their national championship celebration and went to the White House and, and everything. And, and uh, you know, when Coach O said, we love Donald Trump, I just think he met, he treated us well and he liked our team and blah, blah, blah. I didn't think he was saying, uh, let's build a wall or, or something like that. <laughs> right. You know, so, uh, so that was another thing that went awry last year with a lot of racial uh, tension with that. Well, I think you saw, you start to saw, you start to see the, the lopping, the locker room start to tip after his third appearance on Fox News, mm -hmm. fourth appearance on Fox News. I'm not here to debate politics either or talk politics, right. but each station has their agenda. <laughs> and within yeah. the locker room, people see where he is, he is majority speaking on. And that was, to me, that, that was the tipping point in which he started to lose the inner workings of his organization, uh, you know, most notably his locker room. Um, I, I think that that was a, a huge turnoff to, to his, his players and, and to the locker room. And, um, you know, by the time he recognized that, people were opting out. Mm -hmm. And then the, the girl interviewing him, though, she, she went to LSU and ran track right. for LSU. Right. So there was kind of that. There was. Yeah, and, some and, and I, and I agree with I think when he was complimenting Donald Trump that he was really speaking about the experience of the LSU football team. Yeah. Because as the president of the United States, he opened up the White House doors to, I, I think it was, it was told last year when they got back, like the average championship team stays like 48 minutes in the White House. LSU stayed three and a half hours. Yeah. You know, I mean, like it was, <laughs> it, it was, it was incredible the hospitality that they were shown by the White House. I don't think the entire team ever saw the Oval Office. I mean, the entire organization from LSU has taken selfies at his desk. Um, you know, I mean, it was just one of the most memorable uh, images was the uh, you know get the gat the yeah, board along yes, right. uh, Jimmy. Jimmy. Yeah, um, she was dancing and yeah, I mean that was in the Oval Office. <laughs> you know right, I mean that right. was that, that that was access that was rarely seen by championship teams, and I think Ogeron wanted to, to, to just say that he was grateful for that. Yeah. Um, but saying it multiple times on a network that yeah. is known for supporting polit the, the politics that not necessarily will fly in the locker room, I think, was what got noticed. Yeah, that's why I don't want Drew Brees to ever run for office, right? Because it means 50% yeah. of the people are gonna dislike you, right, right. Or, or, or whatever. And well, he, so, saw that, he saw that with the comedy. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, yeah. He, he became polarizing in year 15. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that was one of the he most almost <laughs> made it to the finish line, <laughs> <laughs> almost got there. And right at the end, I mean, he makes one comment that on a, on a Yahoo Finance spot, A bizarre stop, platform very, to appear very on. Very bizarre. Very bizarre, and then that's what people discuss about. You know, that's kind of like that you Google him, and that's one of the first things that pops up. Uh, he, I mean, I'm just a face in the back of the room. He doesn't even know my name. But right. I went to all those press conferences for 15 years and watched the guy never, like, um, insult an opponent. Sure. Never, just like. Just over and above respectful. Wanting to be respectful, like doesn't want to disrespect anybody, right? Like doesn't, right. like, just let me walk as straight a line as I can. <laughs> And on a Yahoo Finance stop and during a pandemic while training camp is suspended, he answers a question and, and it was like the fifth or sixth question of the interview. I mean, it was kind of like yeah. buried at the end. He was, he was on there to talk about walk-ons right. and was, franchising, uh, franchising businesses. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm halfway serious and halfway joking. I wanted to cry that day. I'm like, <laughs> if Drew Brees is the enemy, then we're all in trouble, uh, you right. know? Yeah. I mean, but Dude. it just shows you. Yeah. I mean, how, how vulnerable and fragile that stuff is. Yeah. You know, and, and, and if you're the head football coach and you're in charge of motivating 85 guys and getting them to buy in, believe, and, and, and you know, stick with you for, for three months, four months in competition at the highest level, it's all kind of got to be streamlined. Well, Jordy, I, I, 
look, they get paid millions of dollars. I know that. And if they get fired, they collect millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. But I still think about, you know, 85 guys on a roster and your cell phone can go off at 2, 3, 4 in the morning. Uh, some guys got a problem. I mean, just the dynamics I heard about Leonard Fournette and Darius Geis being on the same team sure. and the jealousy right. and the he got this and I didn't get that and just those kind of things you're juggling. It's, it's just a, it's a, there's a lot of responsibility. There is. And there's a lot more of personnel and personality managing than we can even fathom, right? We, uh, I think even us as the media who have a small bit of access to what they're doing, understand that they're scheming and they're teaching technique and they're trying to make them better football players, but a lot of the time they're really just babysitting them. You know what yeah. I mean? And making sure that they're okay and making sure that they're in a good mental spot and making sure that they have confidence to play and a lot of that stuff you're talking about. A lot of the jealousy issues that, that, that are, are, are there in the locker room and in individual playing rooms. So, you Uncle know, says I should be playing. Yeah, Mama says I should be playing. You told me this in recruiting and, yeah. you told, and he said you told him yeah. the same thing. What's, you know, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it, it's a lot of personality managing. It's a lot of management, a lot of managing of, of, of skills and talents and personalities that go into that thing. It's, uh, it's, it's a big job. Um, the name, image, and likeness, okay? So this is uh, another big new thing. And I, I've seen some things, but would you say it hasn't been like an explosion so far? Yeah, I, I think that it's, it's probably finding its median. You know, it's probably finding its, its average where it's going to sit. I think at the first, you know, this was something that was new and exciting and things that, that, that was something that people had talked about for a long time. But when it comes down to it, if you're a business owner, if you're a brand manager, if you're in charge of cutting that check and, and realizing you're signing over the, the mission statement of your workplace to an 18, 19, 20, 21 year old, then I think that there's a lot of thought that goes behind that. Now there are outlying circumstances. I think every year you'll have a Derek Stingley Jr. Every year you'll have the face and the biggest and the, and the, and the best player who is, you know, on the, on the back end of it, very well respected, very well spoken, uh, carries himself with a very much high reputation uh, that a, like a, you know, a business like Walk-Ons has no problem cutting him a check and saying, hey, promote us. Um, but as far as, you know, I, I, to give you an, an idea, I think when you think of the starting five for the basketball team, mm -hmm. let's say Will Wade starting five, which is going to be very recognizable and pretty good this year, I, I, I think a total would be somewhere around thirty-five, forty thousand dollars $40,000 for them for the year. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So uh, it, that's really nice money. Yeah. It's, it's good, good cash. But, you know, as far as being able to live off that, make a long-term decision off of something like that, I, I don't think that we'll see that come, you know, but, but every once, you know, Joe Burrow is going to come through here, what, once every 25 years? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, the honey bag, Ty Tyron could have gotten a lot of money, you know, back yeah. in 2011. Leonard Fournette. You mm. know, Leonard could have gotten a lot of cash. Joe Burrow would have made a killing on something like this. Oh, my this. God. I'm just thinking 2019 Joe Burrow, uh, what he could have charged for interviews. And or just, just to show up at the mall. You know, yeah. he could call the mall of Louisiana and say, hey, you want me to show up for an hour on Sunday? And knowing if, that if the mall promoted that, the entire city would be there. <laughs> and Joe could say, hey, I'm charging you 300 bucks a picture and I'm charging you 500 bucks a signature. Would Care of the Snake be there too? Or, <laughs> yeah. It depends on who's watching. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, and I've talked to Eddie Fuller. You know, uh -huh. I was yeah. like, the Hobson would have collected. Yeah, Hobson well, would have made money. Here's my here's what I'm thinking about though. It's like in 1988, you catch the earthquake pass. Mm -hmm. So are you like in the locker room? You know, you're celebrating your teammates. We won this game. We did this together. Or does the mind go to, well, yeah. the uh, the deals are so great. The earth is shaking down yeah, here right. at you know uh, Team Honda, and Eddie Fuller will be here Tuesday night from seven to ten. Right. Or Jacob Hester, you know, the, the famous Florida game in 2007. Sure. LSU lost the next week to Kentucky. That's right. So if, if Jacob would have done some, you know, done some, uh, hey, uh, go for it with Jacob Hester yeah. at the varsity in the Molly Ringwalds or whatever. Yeah. Your last chance. It's a fourth down. <laughs> right, 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 right. Don't stay at home. Come out. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. Or whatever it is. And, and so, so do the... As, a, as an athlete at a place like LSU, you know you're going to get criticized no matter what, but do, you know, if you don't perform well the next Saturday, uh, you shouldn't have been doing the math. Definitely. You shouldn't have been doing this. You weren't focused. 100%. I think that one thing that we, we, we have discussed but we haven't gone in depth on is another management of the locker room. I mean, think about Geis and Fournette if name, image, and likeness would have been in play. 
and yep. if Leonard pulls in a contract that's uh, 10,000 more than what Geist gets, or Geist does uh, vice versa, <laughs> what that creates within the locker room. I mean, if they're bickering and going back and forth over playing time and things that are happening off, what do you think they're doing over contracts that are being to go with real money? You know yeah. what I mean? That's the, the, the stuff that you're going to have to step in and manage with, with all that, I, I think, is, is very undervalued at this point just because we haven't seen it. But time will absolutely <laughs> smoke that out, right? I mean, yeah. at some point, somebody's going to say across a locker room, you're making X amount and I'm not, or, or whatever it may be. And now you've got a totally different beast that what you have to manage on your hands as a head coach, you, right? Like you're, <laughs> you're managing family members, expectation, playing time, all of that stuff already. Now you're managing off the field contracts. <laughs> hey, coach O's at practice. Hey, I'm trying to be Florida Saturday, okay? Exactly. You two stop your foolishness. Yeah, right. Sonic Burger King, I don't care. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I have no time for it, but right. you better. Yeah. Because it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to come in and, and affect your team. Yeah. Well, and of course, the guy in Alabama, uh, in Tuscaloosa, I'm sure maybe, you know, his inner old school spirit might have uh, initially kind of revolted against this, but then, sure. but then the wheels start Absolutely. turning. And he just so happens <laughs> to be at a speaking event and say, oh, by the way. Right. In Texas. Into Bryce Young, my quarterback, yeah. who's never started a game, right. hey, he's got a million dollars worth of NIL deals. I know all of you over here in Texas think y'all are getting Arch Manning. <laughs> is what he was saying to that room. But I've already told Arch that our starting quarterback's got a million on the table without taking a snap. I'll have him five by the time he gets to Tuscaloosa <laughs> without playing a down. Wow. Because I think it's going to come down to Sarkeesian and, and, and Saban for that. I mean, if you're kind of reading behind the scenes, it seems like those two have had a, had a really uh, put forth their, their best effort in, in recruiting with, with, with Arch. And I, I know he was at Ole Miss earlier this week, and I think that the family school will – definitely have something to say about that but it seems like now with Texas having the brand of the Southeastern Conference behind them and you know Jacques I think this is is one of those um, it, it, it's one of those unsaid things right now that you don't realize could affect LSU down the line who's to say that the the, the school with the most millionaires doesn't start winning some of these recruiting battles when Texas can come in and say oh you wanted to play in the SEC Arch well now we are a part of the SEC and I've got a booster in in you know in a, some suburb that wants to pay you three hundred thousand dollars a semester just to wear his hat for his his local business after the game LSU can't give you that can they but, uh. but Saban's got ten of those guys that he can call and say hey look in Texas they're negotiating with Arch where they're gonna get him a three hundred thousand dollar deal I need a half a million dollar deal for him and there's, you know, there's 10 boosters down there that would, you know, would run through a wall to pay Saban a half a million dollars <laughs> to get him a quarterback like that. Jordy, when does it become gross? Or is it already past being gross? Yeah, I think it's gross right now. I think we're going into disgusting <laughs> and just, you know, I mean, the sewer of it. I mean, we're going, you know, I mean, you, you are creating, um, you're, you're, you're creating, pro, you know, your professional atmosphere. You know, I mean, that's, that's what you're going to create. Now, I, this was coming, and this was inevitable. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying that, that you, could, you could stop this, or, or, or that I'm even you know, in, in the favor of, of trying to, because I see where it makes sense and, and where it's, it's equitable for, for the student athlete, but the, the, the laws or the lack of the law right now from the NCAA and allowing states to govern this by themselves is, is just going to turn it into a free-for-all. I mean, it's gonna turn it into an absolute, um, you know, who has the most money, who has the most power, and who is going to get the recruits. I think that's, I mean, look, a local high school here in town with a five-star athlete had to throw a sports agent off their campus earlier this week. <laughs> So, I mean, you know yeah. what I mean? It, yes. it, it, it is, it is, they are starting to understand the earlier <clears throat> I can get to these guys and, and start to form that relationship, um, the more I will have an, an inside track to get him once he goes professional. And what about the aspect of creating monsters, too, in terms of, look, we cover all the high school teams in the area, and we interview all, a lot of kids. And there's a lot of um, uh, overwhelming majority, well-spoken, polite, yes, sir, no, sir. But the other day, uh, I won't say who, but I was covering uh, a pretty highly um, rated recruit, and I tweeted some video of him and said, four star, blah, blah, blah. And this person messages me, no hello, no how you doing, five star. 
in the message. Like, I'm not a four star, I'm a five star, which I looked it up. He's a four star, not a five. But anyway, I mean, when, when is it when a 13, 14 year old, you know, uh, you know, used to ask your dad, hey, dad, why can't I do that? Because you're a kid, that's why, and mm -hmm. I'm the adult and I'm right. the parent. When is the, is it 18 now? That When are they, um, when can they think for their own? And when do we, I mean, are we heading towards high schoolers going to get NIL deals as well eventually? I, I hope not. I hope not. But yeah. it seems as if the, uh, the beast is just too big to keep. Yeah you know, to, to keep captivated. I, I just think that when you see that there's a potential like a, you know, let's just look down the, the road, Walker Howard. It, it's fair to say that Walker Howard is going to take snaps on Sunday if he stays on the same trajectory that he's on. Possibly he could be a high round pick to take snaps on Sunday. To me, if it, we, we're not the only ones that notice that, right? I mean, there, there are people at, in, in, in very high-rise offices that understand that there's a five-star quarterback in Lafayette, Louisiana that's going to LSU that we can approach within a year and offer him a contract to do something promotionally. Why don't we just send a runner down to St. Thomas More right now and start getting to know him or yeah. start to get to know his dad yeah. or start to get to know his sisters, start to get to know his people around him and just start forming the relationship. That way, when it's time for him to sign on the dotted line and say, I need representation at the next level, that he doesn't look at us and say, hey, I've been knowing you since I've been 16. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, and, and that's <laughs> how you get there. I mean, Spencer Rattler, the quarterback for Oklahoma, who, you know, going into this name, image, and likeness stuff was one of the top guys to really receive the most recognition and notoriety off of it. He signed with Lee Steinberg. I mean, through this, marketing agency. Derek Stingley Jr. has signed with a marketing agency that also has a wing of its office that, that is a sports agent. You know, I mean, I, I would be, I don't, I'd be willing to bet when Stingley signs with his agency <laughs> that it's probably out of that office. I'd be willing to bet that Spencer Rattler next year at this time will be a Lee Steinberg athlete. You know, so Never I mean, too early to get it's on it. Already, it's already yeah. here. They're just shading it and covering it up with marketing agency. Right, I mean, Lee Steinberg Marketing Agency, but if you go across the hall, it's Lee Steinberg Sports Agency. <laughs> uh, and, 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 you know, it's just w w what Charlie's doing. I mean, yeah. at, Matchpoint. at Matchpoint Connection. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, they are, uh, they're playing middleman to, to these business owners and, and these athletes and putting them uh, in touch with one another. I mean, it's, I, I would love to tell you that it's not gonna happen at the high school level, but it already is. Yeah. It already is. I mean, it's already happening right here in Baton Rouge. It's a lot more complicated than LSU just running out of the yeah, tunnel yeah, and a right. touchdown to right. seven points. And, uh, right. you know, he, go Tigers, let's win. You know, there's just all right, a few more things. Great conversation so far with, uh, with Jordy Collada. What are you hearing on Max Johnson versus Miles Brennan? Because I hear different things. This is where I fall on it. I, I, I think that both of these guys can win SEC games. I think both of these guys are high-level college quarterbacks. It confused me why Miles Brennan came back because I thought that Miles Brennan would see that he's going to be in a similar situation that he's been in the previous four years that he's been in Baton Rouge that was surrounded by a ton of uncertainty, mm -hmm. right? I mean, when you just look at Miles Brennan's career and you lay out that he came from St. Stanislaus playing in a system where they threw it 60 times a game where he stepped in his freshman year to a Matt Canada situation and then ended up playing for Steve Ensminger and Joe Brady back to Ensminger, then Scott Linehan and now going to be playing with DJ Mangus and, 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 and Jake Peets. I mean, it was just a lot of stuff that was going against for Miles Brennan. I think he's got a professional arm. I think he can make NFL throws. I think if he would have gone in the draft, he would have been a fifth, sixth, seventh round pick, undrafted free agent, and he'd have made a team. Because when I look at the quarterback play at the NFL, and especially the backups, I don't think that there's 64 better quarterbacks on this planet than Miles Brennan. But one of them is Max Johnson. And I think Max Johnson gives LSU the best chance to win in 2021. You can win football games with Miles Brennan, but Max Johnson's going to keep opposing defensive coordinators up longer throughout preparation game week. Because He's a better athlete. He keeps plays alive. He has that ability where the quarterback is a threat. In Joe Brady's offense, when I asked him to <coughs> simplify, just tell me what your offense is. Everybody's a threat. Everybody's a threat. Yep, the quarterback's right. a threat. The, the, the left tackle's the best left tackle that we He's a threat. I mean, everybody is a threat. The tight end was a threat. The tight end that is a most. threat. The, the, <laughs> the slot receiver, the running back out of the backfield. You've got to account for everybody doing everything. When I play Miles Brennan as a defensive coordinator, I know he's limited. 
when I play Max Johnson as a defensive coordinator, I know that he can do more things. He can do multiple things, and he can do them at a high level. And I'm with you. I think Ogeron has tipped his hand. Whether, you know, was it two weeks ago when he was on with Bobby Bear and Christian Garrick and Mike Dettelier on WWL when he said, the locker room knows who the quarterback is. The guys know. The coaching staff knows. Well, if it's that public, right, if it's that known and it's not Miles Brennan, well, then you are tipping your hand, right? Because I think everybody sees the scenario of maybe Brennan needs the security and maybe he needs the mindset that he's the opening day starter to keep him on the roster and that way you securely set that you have two quarterbacks to play with this season. Um, or he knows that if he names Johnson the guy right now that he potentially could lose Miles Brennan to a place like Well, Texas. that's the whole thing, right? Don't or, transfer. Exactly, because then you're looking at, you know, you're kind of back to where LSU – has yeah. been so many times where you've got one guy that you say, hey man, save the season, and if you don't, you gotta go to a true freshman in Garrett Nussmeyer who has no experience, not ready to play, coming off of an injury, and who you told in recruiting, it'll probably be two years before you take a meaningful snap. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You'll play and you'll get some time, but that'll be mop-up duty, it'll be clean-up time, it'll be to get you some quality reps. We don't want to give you, if you're LSU speaking to Nussmeyer, you don't want to give Nussmeyer any type of snap that means anything. Just because right. he, 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 it could stunt his growth, and it could mean that the program is in a bad, bad spot. You know, we, we've seen it too many times. I mean, the, the, the list is long of, <laughs> of, of Anthony Jennings and Jordan Jefferson's of Jared guys Lee that, that played the, way the, too early. Right? I mean, that played way before their time. And if you're staring at Max Johnson and his backup is Nussmeyer and you're a play away from a true freshman, yeah. well, as good as I told you I think LSU is <laughs> 10 minutes ago, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't matter. Yeah. All right. Uh, great conversation uh, wrapping up here with, uh, with Jordy Collada. And, yeah, and I had heard the rumors, too, that, you know, Miles Brennan, he's going to go to Baylor with mm -hmm. Dave Aranda or mm -hmm. some other place. But he's still there. Yeah. I guess my question is can he get hit? because he had this freaky injury. I don't guess anyone's hit him. He's been tackled. No, I mean, it's a, the, the freakish injury, the, the most freaky. I think it's he, if he would have opted to have surgery, they were going to name it Miles Brennan. They're going to name it like Tommy John. They were going to yeah. name it Miles Brennan. <laughs> That's I right. Mean, they, I mean, because they just had never seen it. So, so I yeah. think that you, you, you do wonder where he is on his rehabilitation there. And for all that we, I guess, say and, and speak that storyline of he's got to be the starter or else he's transferring, nobody's ever heard that officially from Brennan or his camp. Nobody's yeah. heard that from LSU. And you're right. He's still here. You know what I mean? Yeah. And one thing that we do know about Miles Brennan, because he's told us in the media this, it was his dream growing up to be the LSU starting quarterback. Who the hell am I to tell him to give up on that dream? Right. You know what I mean? And if, if he sees that it, it's it's – He's got a chance, and he sees a crack to be the starting quarterback. Well, then go get it, man. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I, I, like I said, I think you can win football games with Miles Brennan. I think when you look at LSU's quarterback room <clears throat> and you debate these guys just side by side, I think the edge goes to the younger guy in Johnson just because of his physical skill set and his athleticism. But, again, yeah. if you've got Brennan, you're not, you're not in a bad place. Right. You know, you're not, you're he's, not, he just had some bad luck. That he, the greatest he, player he, in LSU history transfers from Ohio State. Really? I mean, his first year, I mean, Miles Brennan was John, take. He yeah. played against Alabama as a true freshman. Yeah, like, I was I there. Mean, Matt put him Canada in. was like barking into the headset, we need to play Brennan. If we want to win this game, we need to play Brennan. Mm -hmm. And he got out there and threw it around. And I mean, if you, you dig up that film, he looks like a 10th grader. <laughs> I mean, yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Like he is yeah. he's very, very young getting experience and it left the fan base, media members, guys that were covering people that were covering the program to say, Wow, the future's bright with Brennan. You know, I mean he's getting yeah. these That's 2017 reps. we're he's, talking. If he's getting yeah. these reps right now, I mean, wow, w w think about what the future is going to hold with this guy. Yeah. And the way that it's played out, you're right. I mean, the best player that's ever walked through the program's <laughs> locker room shows yeah. up for 2 years and then, you know, you 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 have a an injury that even the medical professionals can't even explain. Yeah. Let's wrap up with this cuz this is a fascinating topic. Nick Saban, okay? So, Nick Saban uh, should be praised for all the success he gave LSU. And then on the other side, he is um, vilified mm -hmm. for all the success he's prevented <laughs> at, at LSU as well. There's no doubt, I believe, that you would agree that a, a great deal of Les Miles' success was set up by Nick Saban in terms of uh, the Cox Communications building for student-athletes, the uh, football ops building, 
Uh, certainly, there were the talent that was left behind, the Glenn Dorseys, Dwayne Bowes, and on down the line that were all here. Um, this guy is going to turn 70. Yeah. Halloween, and I watched him last year after Alabama beat LSU down, jog into the locker room. Uh, Jacob Hester at SEC Media Days tells me he, he's got as much energy as he did when he recruited me. When is this going to end? Um, he looks better now than he did when he took the LSU job. <laughs> he looks significantly better now than when he was Michigan State's head coach in Cleveland's, the Browns, defensive coordinator. Lost the glasses, the Coke bottle. Uh, <laughs> is a great testimony to what money can do for you, right? <laughs> like once you run across generational money and you just say, hey, make me young again. Hey, we it, give J-Lo credit, but she's got some people around right. her to kind of. Right, okay. um, but he is a great testimony to what money and, and spending on, on, on youth, you know, the, the fountain of youth, can do because I, I'm like you. I, I don't see an end in sight for this guy. And as it's gone on, it's become more enjoyable to him. You know, for Bear Bryant, for guy, you know, all those guys, for all those people that stayed in it way to, at the end, they were like, they were angry and they were mad and you couldn't <laughs> talk to them. And, and, and you know, they, they, they would kind of shoo you off. And they, they, they left the game because they weren't, they weren't producing on the field anymore. You know what I mean? Like right. Charlie Mack and those teams were beating game, Bear Bryant. Game passes you buy. At the end of it. Exactly. Yeah. And this guy has not only shown that he is the best recruiter the sport has ever seen, he has adapted better than anybody in his profession when everybody thought that there was no chance that he would ever get out of this I formation, control the clock, beat you with defensive type of style. He goes out and hires Lane Kiffin, Steve Sarkeesian, and on down the line of guys that are forward thinkers that keep him relevant, not only in recruiting, but national championship type contention. And to me, that, that's what's haunted Les Miles and even kind of peaked its head in 2020 with Ed Ogeron of kind of saying, I don't want to hire somebody that could take my job. You know, that was always Les Miles' deal, where he never wanted to bring anybody that was perceived smarter than him because Up and they, they, he always thought, hey, he's, you know, they're going to exploit me. <laughs> I mean, they're yeah. they're going to they, <laughs> see, what, what, why do we have this guy? I mean, we can just give it to him. Um, and, and Saban has been so comfortable in his own skin to, to bring in guys and rehabilitate them and give them opportunities that he has experienced so much success off of it, right? I mean, uh, I, I, I love the guy. I, I respect him immensely for what he has accomplished within the, the, the sport. You and I kind of had a front row seat to him during his time. He was, you know, I was a part of John Brady's program where we were in the building and would see him working tirelessly throughout the night. He, he would go back and forth with the basketball program on a couple of recruits like Corey Webster and Marcus Spears and Michael Clayton during that time. So it, it, you were able to kind of see him in an, in an environment where he was working. And, you know, guys at the highest, like John Brady at the time and Butch Pierre, they, they, he'd leave the room and people would be like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that, that's the dude. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, that's the guy. That's, that's, what it's, that's what it sounds like. That's what it looks like. That's what it feels like. That's, that's a championship Coach. Well, Brady the other day told me, remember when y'all all saying that <laughs> Nick Saban, the game passed him by and he was getting old. I just pissed him off is all it did, you know. And so when a bad season at Alabama is 11-2, and two, they yeah. finished eighth in the country, and the two games they lost were to Joe Burrow and – Auburn on the last play of the game. Yeah, the silly Auburn <laughs> kicker hits the upright from 25 yards, or the, right. the Alabama kicker, I should say, to tie the game. Their losses are so memorable. Right. I think Paul Feinbaum said that. When Bama loses, it's so memorable – because it never, it, it hardly ever happens, and it's not expected. Right. That's the thing is that there's no expectation to lose. So when you happen, it is shock worthy. I mean, said, "Whoa, they, they got <laughs> beat." You know what I mean? Like, right. how did they lose? But um, I, I think he deserves. I think he deserves a statue at LSU. I think he deserves, if not a statue, you should name a road after him. You should name something after him because of what he. Oh, not only for the, the athletic program and the football department, for the university. I mean, he was the, if you look back at the, the numbers of out-of-state tuition and the, the amount of construction that was happening on campus at that time and the, the upgrades, you mentioned the Cox Communication Building, the, 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 the football facility to, to, to the baseball, all of that stuff kind of went into the success 
that LSU was experiencing on what Mark Emmert called the front porch of the university, the football program. That's what everybody sees. Yeah. And, and when they see it running at such a professional click, where it was running at such a just, I mean, it was running so good that Miles really, I mean, you know, I, I know that I am one of his biggest attractors and <laughs> I, I find ways to dump on him. But really, you could have taken less miles, put him in the catbird seat, and said, we have just given you a national championship. Just don't wreck this thing, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, if you just keep it steady as she goes, you should be playing for a national championship at least two out of the next three years. Yeah. Right? And, and I mean, you know, two triple overtimes later, he backdoors in in New Orleans <laughs> and gets one that, that he should. I mean, yeah. Trent Johnson sent an SEC championship ring to John Brady in 2009. Yeah, Les Miles should have mailed Nick Saban a championship <laughs> ring in 2007. <laughs> I mean, you know. So, so since 2003, LSU has won three national titles and Alabama. Played for a fourth. Played for a fourth and Alabama's won six. Right. So that's nine. Played for eight. Yes. So what, what I'm getting at, nine national titles between the two and Nick Saban has a direct impact. Eight of the nine? For sure. Ogeron's kind of stands on its own because it's 2019. O stands on, and even the 11 appearance. Yeah, with the Matthew appearance. And, absolutely. With Matthew and that team. That's his I best think team. That, that was his best team. That, yeah. that could be argued outside of 19 is LSU's best team. They were really awesome. and truly. I mean, yeah. um, but but you know that that 05 team, that first team that Miles had, that 06 team with with Jamarcus and Debo as and those guys and their junior. I mean, that team with Kyle Williams and. Yeah. Marcus, I mean, that team was it, nasty. Was, it, it, it was it was a it was an amazing dynamic for LSU to go eleven and two, finish fifth in the country, eleven and two, finish third in the country, yeah. and still people say yeah. we underachieved. They did. That's we right. did not uh, do as well as we should have. Les Miles got me thinking. Oh my, you know, yeah. what am I got but, myself but, into? But, but he, he took four first round picks with. Debo, Buster, Jamarcus, and LaRon to Auburn that year and got beat 7-3. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? I mean, it was, it was just, it was headbanging, just maddening on, and, and if you remember on the last possession of the game, he, he let Jamarcus throw it, yeah. and Craig Davis got knocked out of bounds at the two-yard line. I, I've said it many times, I would see Craig Buster Davis at the gym that I would go work out at. And he would bring up that game every time oh, I saw him. He maddening. was still mad about that game. We should have thrown the ball. We had no business losing to Auburn in 2006. It was funny, you know. Jock, if they win the game, they're in the national championship. Oof. Well, I never really thought about that I mean, they went 11 and two. Right. I mean, you the, win the, that the, game the, that day, you're in. That's all remembered for the early do set pass yes. interference flag that got picked up, but but it should be it more. It should have never been that close. Right. It should have never been that close. Right. We've been talking for almost an hour, man. I appreciate yeah, this. Great really conversation. Right. We will Always. definitely do it again. Always. Uh, we will definitely be utilizing Jordy during the football season, and uh, we talked a lot about Nick Saban. But obviously, we hope that LSU uh, will get the best of them in early November when they go to Tuscaloosa, and we're looking forward to a great season. LSU reports to camp next week, and then the first day of practice right after. Thanks for stopping by.